Then without much further ado, may I introduce to you Dr. Geraldine Gina Abaidu. As I mentioned, Geraldine is our chapter chairperson for the Ghana chapter in West Africa. Um, last week we had the West Africa chairperson facilitating Shayo Imologome, and I think Shayo is also with us this morning. Um, and this morning it is Geraldine Abaidu. Next week it will be the East Africa chapter doing the facilitation, Ms. Emma Rono. Um, we, we're really privileged to have these three uh, women um, from across West to East Africa facilitating these three, semi, these three webinars. Dr. Geraldine, Gina Abaidu is a dedicated and passionate professional with over 24 years of experience in business strategy, in project management, insurance, marketing management and training. She's the founder and chief executive officer of Per Focus Innovations Limited, a training and business management consulting firm experienced in assisting organizations to improve their project practice, program and portfolio management and deployment of best business solutions to create synergy and business growth. Geraldine has over 17 years experience in the insurance industry and has developed strong negotiation, planning, communication, and leadership skills. Her expertise is in business strategy, business risk assessment, training, mentoring, food, and catering services. She was awarded the Doctor of Business Administration, a project management option by Walden University USA in 2015 after the completion of a dissertation on the topic customer satisfaction factors in life insurance growth in Ghana. She holds an MBA in marketing from the University of Ghana, Legion BA Honours English major, diploma in education from the University of Cape Coast, and diploma in catering and gourmet cooking from the Penn Foster School in the States. She completed a senior management development program from the University of Stellenbosch Business School from our eight partners and attended numerous conferences and training programs in Ghana and abroad. Dr. Geraldine sits on the boards of Hollard Life and Digital Leads Consult Limited and the executive of the USB Alumni Association in South Africa. She is a member of Executive Women Network and a fellow of the International Institute for African Scholars, PIAS, a member of Chartered Institute of Marketing, UK, a fellow of the Chartered Insurance Institute, Ghana, and a consultant in renewable energy for UNDP. Geraldine, with such an absolutely awesome CV, we know we're in your good hands. You're a valuable partner for us in the Alumni Association. Thank you so much for your time and for facilitating this session this morning with Professor Martin Butler. Over to you, Geraldine. Thank you so much, Christelle. I'm really delighted to be here this morning and a good and pleasant day to everyone. I know it's morning in Ghana and afternoon in um, Joburg and Cape Town. Thank you so much for joining us to discuss this very important topic that impacts our now and the future. This morning, as I go through my morning header, I, ch I chance on the wall of the Vice President of Ghana, Dr. Mahmoud Baumia, on Facebook. And I want to quote what I read from his wall. It is quite clear that COVID-19 has more than necessary showed us that embracing self-reliance in production and digitization in our governance and everyday life is indispensable. In this light, governments will continue to pursue the agenda of Ghana Beyond Aid with formalization through digitization as a key pillar. And of course, the fourth industrial revolution is linked to digitization. In preparing for this webinar, I did a brief research on the fourth industrial revolution. Believe you me, I have not given it a thought before. I was put on the spot by USB to facilitate this program. But I came to realize quickly that I have been in this space for quite some time because I got involved in a project with brisk digital technology to bring the digital transactional solutions to the insurance industry 
in Ghana. Yes, with the fourth industrial revolution, we stand on the brink of technology that will profoundly modify the way we live, work, and relate to one another. I must say, I do not know how it will unfold, but certainly this must comprehensively engage us and cause us to respond and integrate this revolution involving all stakeholders, be it public or private sectors, academia, and civil society. We all know in history, we did the first revolution using water and steam, the second revolution where electric power was on, the third came with electronics and information technology. What is the nature of the fourth industrial revolution? Today, we are fortunate to have with us Professor Martin Butler to bring more insight into this fourth industrial revolution. I want to read briefly um, on Prof. Butler. Prof. Butler is an associate professor at the Stellenbosch University Business School and a research associated with the Institute for Future Studies. He holds an electronic engineering degree from the University of Pretoria, an MBA and a PhD from USB. Martin heads up the USB's teaching and learning that oversees the delivery of the USB full academic portfolio of 13 graduate programs. I have earned a new friend. He joined academia in 2007 after a 15 year career in the ICT industry. So we are all in safe hands. His career started as a software developer and has progressed from software development to business analysis, project and program management, and ICT consulting. And, and I believe we have something in common when it comes to project management. Martin has successfully led various project teams in South Africa and abroad in ICT and technology intrinsic business projects during his career. Prof. Martin has an active interest in the related field of digital transformation, technology futures, project management and innovation management, and lectures in these disciplines at the USB and in Europe and Asia. He also consults in industry and academia in these areas. Martin is passionate about the utilization of ICT in education and strives for the innovation use of technology in his teaching. He serves in an advisory capacity on the effective use of ICT usage to many educational business entities. He was a project leader and program manager for the USB school's graduate diploma that uses a pioneering virtual classroom concept. Thank you, Prof, for bringing us here. You made it possible. A University of Stellenbosch first. Martin was the program director of the USB's MBA program for four years. Doing that lead to several achievements, including strong growth in international ranking and full re-accreditations. So ladies and gentlemen, I introduce to you Prof. Martin. But before he comes on board, I want to take us briefly on today's and ask you the program for the day. So Prof. will take us through to know what Africa can contribute to the fourth industrial revolution. After that, there will be questions and answers. Um, I will take that up and then we would break after we are done with the questions and contributions into another session where we'll have information session with Prof. Meshak Aziakonu, and that will be facilitated by Mariki. Thank you so much, Prof. You have our attention. Thank you. Thank you for the kind introduction, Geraldine. I truly appreciate that. Um, Colleagues, ladies, gentlemen, it is my privilege today to share with you a little bit about um, how I think Africa can make a contribution um, to the fourth industrial revolution. 
Um, it's a topic um, that is very much top of mind for me because as scholars on the African continent, um, we are always asking ourselves, um, Christelle, Rizal, you will just have to enable screen sharing for me. I'm disabled from this side so that I can do my, my death by PowerPoint. Um, we, we, we're always asking ourselves is how, how do we contribute from this continent? I have sometimes said that uh, I meet some of the, the most uh, cutting edge or strongest or globally most renowned African academics when I go to conferences in North America and Europe. And um, I think it's important for us to retain um, our talent on the continent, but it's also for us to understand how we actually contribute and what is the agenda um, that we can use to contribute. Um, Christelle and Zell, you can just make me the co-host and then I'll be able to, to share as well. I'm still not, not able to share my, my screen. And the topic of, of the African contribution um, on, on the fourth industrial revolution um, is something that I've been thinking of for a while. Um, as Geraldine, um, with our common background, I'm intrigued about the impact of the fourth industrial revolution. Um, and, I'm, and I'm wondering, um, can we actually contribute? Um, do we have the ability to, to contribute? Um, and this led me to the topic, and I have a small little agenda today. Um, I, I would firstly like to start off with um, different perspectives. So um, I, I'm a technologist. Um, I love technology and all things technology related. Um, but there are different perspectives on the fourth industrial revolution and um, seeing that Professor Aziopono is, is after me, I have to acknowledge that there's economists in the world as well, although we all know that economists are not as important as the project managers and um, the technologists as Geraldine would agree with me. Um, but there are different perspectives on these things. I would also um, then like to just recap very briefly what Geraldine has said, we'll talk about the fourth industrial revolution in particular. And then I'll spend a little bit of time on terms of, so what are the key challenges? Um, because uh, a contribution is always within the area of, of a key challenge. I find in business school, sometimes students think that a, a competitive advantage is something that I'm good at. And I have to remind them that the competitive advantage is not something that you're good at. It's something that you are better at than somebody else. So if there are two lecturers in technology in the business school and the one is very poor, all I have to be is poor and then I have a competitive advantage. But if the one is very good, then I have to be extremely good to have a competitive advantage. And similarly, if, if Africa wants to make a contribution, we have to address current problems within the academic discourse and within the public domain and within the industry. So we, we can't sit and um, come to the table and say we have this contribution to make unless we understand. So what are the key challenges that we are sitting? And, and that could be a, an entire week seminar series. So I've just picked up one or two key challenges and um, that's very much part of the public discourse, although I acknowledge that there are many, many other challenges as well. And within that, I will then just frame very quickly what I believe is the contribution that, that we can make. So, so first up, um, just to different perspectives, um, I'm just going to acknowledge very quickly the technological and the economic perspective on, on the uh, fourth industrial revolution. So from a technological point of view, um, we are mostly feeling that we are sitting within a fifth or a sixth um, and for some observers, even a sixth, wa a sixth wave of, of technological transformations. And, and, and to this day, one of the foremost researchers in this area remain uh, Carlota Perez, a, Br uh, a Brazilian academic. And she writes a lot about technology futures. And she then argues how the world has seen certain technological transformations. And um, according to some of those musings and writings, um, there's a currently a sixth technological transformation, um, although there is a very active debate in terms of does it sit within the biological space, within the material space, within artificial intelligence, and um, there's a lot of interesting discussions over there. Uh, another view that probably sits um, in the middle of the technological and um, economic perspective is a Russian academic, Kontradiv, um, that was only acknowledged years after he passed, and a lot of these materials were translated from Russian to English. And he explained to us that we see these massive waves. And you can see, um, according to the theory that Kontratif um, popularized in, in the then Prussia and Russia, um, we have these huge economic cycles, but these cycles actually coincide um, with technology. And you can see, according to um, that particular perspective, we, we are also actually in the, in, in the fifth wave. 
However, um, if you take an economic perspective, the economists always uh, measure certain things. And the one thing they really like measuring is um, GDP. And, and economists are intrigued by changes in economical structure when there are uh, fluctuation points within economic output at country level or at individual level like GDP per capita. And, and the economists are then looking at um, the transformation of the world and society. And the current view um, on the fourth industrial revolution from Paul, uh, Charles Schwab um, from the World Economic Forum is more based from that particular perspective. And the one example that I used um, last night for, for the students from Ghana as well, um, this is a, is a perfect example of how um, the structure of the economy has changed fundamentally um, over the last six or seven hundred years. And if you go back in history, 600 years or 500 years, by distance, the majority of people were employed and, um, and not necessarily employed to the extent that we understand employment with all of the regulations today, but people were working within agriculture. And you can see on the graph um, how that just um, completely changed um, throughout the history. And currently, if you look at a country like England, about 1.2% of people are employed in agriculture. In South Africa, it's still slightly more because of many of the informal um, economic uh, agricultural activities, um, but still fundamentally different. Um, and, and, and the reality is, is if we were still using the technology that we used 20 years ago, 50 years ago, and 100 years ago to, to do agricultural production and output, the entire world would be in famine today. Um, we, we cannot use the technology and the methods that we used 50 years ago because all of us would be hungry um, and we wouldn't have pinotage to drink. So it's important that we actually have these technological transformations which leads to economical transformation and it improves the entire structure of the economy um, and the basic principles of supply and demand and relative costs and all of these things um, then, then come into play. So that's the, the, the two perspectives on this. If we look at the industrial revolutions, this is the picture that was used in the initial article that popularized the term, the fourth industrial revolution. And this particular picture um, was the first time that somebody used that term. And when Charles Schwab said what we are now in the fourth industrial revolution, um, everybody nodded their heads and then we understood first, second and third, which I will have to explain now shortly. But, but he then said that this fourth industrial revolution is, is the cyber physical systems. I find that for many audiences, the, 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 just the depiction of the third revolution is slightly problematic. So I actually like to replace that. I'm saying for many of us, the embodiment of the third industrial revolution is the computers and the mobile phones that we work with and not necessarily an automotive, uh, automated factory um, which few as of us have seen, and we don't necessarily feel um, as closely tied to that transformation of, of the manufacturing process. For us, there's a factory that produces cars, but if we talk about how we deal with society, our networks, our work environment, um, we understand that the computer and the mobile phone um, has changed that fundamentally. Now, the first industrial revolution um, was mostly then about energy. So, so at that stage, human beings were doing the work. And because we uh, took coal from the ground, um, we could burn the coal, we could uh, develop the steam engine, and the steam engine started really in 1760-ish um, in Britain to change how physical work um, was being performed. Second industrial revolution uh, coincided um, with our discovery of oil um, and the development of the internal combustion engine. Um, and we created new ways to generate energy. Uh, and again, energy and the consumption of energy and the replacement of labor, which was at that stage mostly performed by steam or still by humans where it couldn't scale to the smaller level. It's not that easy to scale a, a steam powered engine to a level to trans uh, to, for example, a uh, motor car, although they were limited motor cars. Um, and it then led to the automation of factories as well. So mass automation of factories. And quite often when we think about um, the second industrial revolution, 
we think about steel, um, chemical synthesis, and, and everything that's, that's associated with that. And that then left to the third industrial revolution, or led to the third industrial revolution. And although telecommunication uh, was not um, new to the third industrial revolution, within the second industrial revolution, we had the telegraph, we had means of communications, and um, these means of communications changed fundamentally. Um, it was democratized that every citizen could get a telephone. We didn't all have telegraphs. We needed to go to a central place for where the communication was taking place. But in the third industrial revolution, um, we had the ability to communicate. Um, and we soon found the ability to actually process information with computers and all of these things. And this led to a myriad of interesting applications. It led to us exploring space. Yes, of course, rocket technology comes from the 1940s, but it was really only in the 1950s and 60s um, that we had the ability to crunch the numbers and to send somebody to the moon um, and to develop new materials, technologies, and certain of the materials and the things that's transporting the world today. The culmination of the third industrial revolution um, for me, sits within the rise of near, near zero marginal cost phenomenon. If, if we were having this alumni webinar um, in a physical meeting today, um, and we would use um, a physical place and there would be chairs and all of these things, it would mean that if we want to add 10, 20 or 30 individuals, um, there would be a cost component. We needed to have seats, we needed to have a cup of coffee, and we need to make provision for all of that. Um, in the advent of the third industrial revolution, to add another 10 or 20 or 30 people to this Zoom call um, has no impact whatsoever. Yes, it has a marginal impact. It's maybe 0.001% more energy consumed on Zoom servers, and it needs to be a little bit of connectivity. But we are moving towards a space of, of near zero impact on multiple fronts, and, and distribution of music is a, is a, pra is a practical example of how we needed to go to a store to buy an LP or a CD. And today we just click two buttons on our mobile phone, we download the music and we then play it over wireless devices now. So the, the transactional cost of certain activities are being um, reduced to, to near zero. But this is only the third industrial revolution. Um, and, and it is the culmination or the tail end of the third industrial revolution. Now, just like the first industrial revolution allowed the second and the second enabled the energy that drove the computers that powered the third revolution, the third industrial revolution is also um, laying the foundation for then the fourth industrial revolution. And the fourth industrial revolution is where we talk about the cyber physical world. Now, just for the end of my history lesson here, in the 1970s and 80s, um, we had large-scale automation. In the 90s and the noughties, the internet came and the internet said um, we could actually do many, many things different from what we've done it before. I see one of my ex-students and a man very really close to my heart, Sabello, which is doing guest lectures for us at the moment, and Sabello works in the operations environment. And Sabello will tell you, if you look at the operations environment and you think where we were 10 years ago, 20 years ago, and 30 years ago, that environment has changed tremendously. And the culmination, or probably not the culmination, the essence of the fourth industrial revolution is that we are starting to blur the boundaries between the physical and the digital. Whereas in the third, we had automation in the fourth industrial revolution, we have these smart connected products, um, we have capabilities, um, and it means that there's a whole host of new strategic choices that we need to make. We need to understand how value is now created, what we do with data, and mostly within the third industrial revolution, data was either at a transactional operational level that led to some, um, some automation, or it was sent to human overlords and the humans needed to, to make a decision. Um, in the fourth industrial revolution, we are not only allowing the power of the machines to make the decisions, they actually execute the decisions as well. And a lot of the trades that we would define as being human trades, the ability to make sense of information, the tacit knowledge that we sat with, um, we are now embedding in all of these systems. And many of these decisions are no longer just an algorithm of a bank to decide whether you get a loan or not, um, but it has a physical result. 
Um, it means that we can physically do something. If we have an algorithm that is determining when a rhinoceros wearing collar is in danger of being poached, and we can automatically dispense a drone and the drone can give us visual oversight and an infrared layer for tactical teams to respond. There is no human intervention um, between a rhinoceros in distress and having aerial condition. And that just means is decision making automated, but also the physical world, the boundaries being automated. And, and one of the, the interesting applications, I'm always very really intrigued by these applications, is intelligent life poise in many, many um, for many, many years, we had um, people sitting next to swimming pools and the sea, and they were looking for humans in distress. And when there was a human in distress, they needed to swim out to those humans. Um, then we had automated live voice that could guide themselves to the human. And today we have automated decision-making powers where there's actually an oversight ability to see if a person in the sea or in a swimming pool um, is in peril and it could then automatically dispatch a help device to help um, that particular person. So that's that, that blurring of the boundaries, if you wish. Now, now this fourth industrial revolution um, is, is actually fairly well displayed if you, if you look at a, a visual analysis. And, and when you want to depict the first industrial revolution, you just put up a steam train and everybody knows what you talk about. When you want to depict a second, we put up a factory. And again, people nod and say, I understand what we're dealing with it. And we want to do the third, um, we put up a computer and we say, okay, I get conception of what it is. The, the moment that you turn to the source of all wisdom and you ask Google, please give me a picture of um, the fourth industrial revolution, the picture becomes inherently complex. All of a sudden, we do not have a single icon that it depicts for us this blurring between the physical and the digital, the hyperconnectivity, the omnipresence of data and processing power, the algorithms and means of decision making, um, blurring the boundary back from the digital to the physical and performing a particular function. And, and, and that's the challenge that we are then sitting in when we are dealing with um, the, the fourth industrial revolution. Now, I've just brought a couple of examples with me, and um, some of my students have seen these examples, but I kind of, um, over the years, whenever I see something interesting, I just grab these examples. But on the top left, you can see an Amazon automated factory. Those are the robots of Amazon. On the top right is a robot that's delivering food for a human. Bottom left is additive manufacturing, where we're printing a house. And then the bottom right is my favorite. That is a virtual faculty member. Um, the gentleman that you see there is in Canada. The conference is in Stockholm, um, but he's physically virtually present. So apologies, he's virtually present um, and he is lecturing to us. Um, and the experience is truly amazing. You feel like um, that particular person is in the room with you. Um, if we look at the customer value proposition of these fourth industrial te uh, revolution technologies, um, a, a lovely example, a local example for me is Discovery Health. Our Discovery has devices that we wear on our wrists. Um, it monitors our activity. We get incentivized. Um, there's a whole supply chain of information that helps them to guide our physical behavior through the collection of information, the processing of information, and allowing us then to do things differently. The top right is the museum in Chicago, completely blurring the physical and the digital world. If you tell a group of 10 year olds, let's go to the museum, you will hear them cry. If you tell them, let's go to the museum in Chicago, they would love to because the interaction um, is fundamentally different. Um, we all know about how the Kenyans have democratized mobile money. It's probably sitting in between the third and the fourth industrial revolution. And then the bottom right is a, is a store without any checkout points where you just walk in, you just grab the device and you walk out. And again, this blurring of the boundaries because the moment that I pick up the device, I'm already, um, I have to pay, apologies, when I pick up goods, I have to pay for those goods. But when I put it back on the shelf, it actually gets credited again. So the whole cycle of what for us is consumer purchasing um, has become a blurry cycle. I walk in, I pick it up, I go out, because money is digital, recognition is digital, and I have a digital means of authenticating myself, I can automate the entire process. Often people are saying, but what about agriculture? And, and, and agriculture is such a prime example, and within South Africa, and Africa in particular, there are brilliant examples of how we are blurring um, the boundaries, um, what, what is actually happening in agriculture, 
and how we deploy the technology. And the lovely thing about the fourth industrial revolution is that you can actually create pictures of some of these things because there's inherent logic of a drone automatically spraying a field, the boom at the bottom right, that's recognizing only where there is growth that shouldn't be there and then zapping that particular growth, an automated vegetable garden, and it goes right down into something like um, in the food services industry where there's automatic pizza making machines. Um, and in America, I worked in Silicon Valley for a while and there was a standing joke in the US that where do arts graduates find work? Well, that joke has come to backfire because today arts graduates are in high demand and many business schools are implementing arts kind of, of degrees. But it was mostly said that you can always flip burgers, um, but Flippy the robot is now flipping the burger. So in the bottom right corner, um, you can see that Flippy is flipping the burgers and it means that the human being is not necessarily there. And it leads to probably the most common question that I'm asked um, when we talk about the fourth industrial revolution, or then in particular, the subsets of the fourth industrial revolution, like um, robotics or artificial intelligence or machine learning, it says, but what about humans? What about employment? Um, the, the, our continent and South Africa as a country and um, Ghana as a country and many countries across our continent actually have a little bit of challenges and, and what then happens to, to, to human and employment in, in this particular space. So i just like to, to, to um, conclude my visual overview with a final video and just give you an idea. It's actually not um, a new video. It's um, I think about two years old already, um, but it's a lovely example um, of blurring the boundaries between the physical and the digital, because we all know that there's algorithms that can do certain things automatically once presented with information in the correct format. But when we blur these boundaries, we've got algorithms that can actually listen to human voice, interpret the human voice, make sense of the human voice, decide what to say, then construct that, and then synthesize that into a human voice, speaking back to a human voice. And um, the Alphabet Group, of which Google is part, is certainly global, globally one of the companies on the cutting edge of this. And here is a very quick three-minute video um, of an example of um, a Google automated assistant that makes an automatic um, telephone call. The progress with the assistant. As I said earlier, our vision for our assistant is to help you get things done. It turns out a big part of getting things done is making a phone call. You may want to get an oil change schedule, maybe call a plumber in the middle of the week, or even schedule a haircut appointment. You know, we are working hard to help users through those moments. We want to connect users to businesses in a good way. Businesses actually rely a lot on this, but even in the US, 60% of small businesses don't have an online booking system set up. We think AI can help with this problem. So let's go back to this example. Let's say you want to ask Google to make you a haircut appointment on Tuesday between 10 and noon. What happens is the Google Assistant makes the call seamlessly in the background for you. So what you're going to hear is the Google Assistant actually calling a real salon to schedule the appointment for you. Let's listen. Hello, how can I help you? Hi, I'm calling to book a woman's haircut for a client. Um, I'm looking for something on May 3rd. Sure, give me one second. Mm-hmm. Sure, what time are you looking for around? At 12 p.m. We do not have a 12 p.m. available. The closest we have to that is a 1.15. Do you have anything between 10 a.m. and uh, 12 p.m.? Depending on what service she would like, what service is she looking for? Just a woman's haircut for now. Okay, we have a 10 o'clock. 10 a.m. is fine. Okay, what's her first name? The first name is Lisa. Okay, perfect. So I will see Lisa at 10 o'clock on May 3rd. Okay, great. Thanks. Great. Have a great day. Bye.
example of uh, a clear blurring of the boundaries and um, there are lovely videos online um, one of the, my favorites is where you ask where a student asks her google assistant to phone her parents to check in maybe ask for a little bit of pocket money because she wants to go to a concert um, over the weekend so um ladies gentlemen it brings us to the question so what, what is what is fundamentally different this time around um technology has always um, reshaped the world if we look at the typewriter um, the printing press um, the automotive the steam engine um, weaving materials um, we've always had technologies um, like computers and telephones and the likes that is shaping the world around us and, and, and led to a world um, that is slightly different. And I think this time around, um, there's a couple of attributes that we need to think about very, very carefully when we plan our reaction in industry and at a country level um, about, uh, around uh, the fourth industrial revolution. The first um, is no doubt um, the pace of the transformation. And the pace of the transformation has a really, really in interesting impact. Previous industrial revolutions meant that humans could mostly exit the job that they held while the new generation was being trained for a new position. Let me try to be very practical here. The father was a stagecoach driver. And when the steam engine came and the steam engine changed how human beings were transported, the pace at which the steam engine came and the railroads were being built meant that the daughter could learn how to become a locomotive driver. And the father could still retire at age 60 or 65 or 70 as a stagecoach driver. The father did not necessarily have to reskill at age 50 because they were no longer stage coaches. And the same is true for all elements of work. It was not a common occurrence that in the first, the second, and to an extent, the third industrial revolution, that we needed to completely reskill. Yes, we needed to skill. We are still teachers, but we use technology now. Um, we still build bridges, but we now use a computer and not a slide rule anymore. But we still construct bridges and we still teach. So within the second, and the third industrial revolutions, we would mostly exit the career that we started with, and we needed to learn a couple of skills along the way. In the fourth industrial revolution, that is no longer the case. There is a significant amount of people that is in employment today that will be completely unemployable in 10 and 20 years time, unless they fundamentally reskill themselves. It is not that there are new jobs for their children, it is that there are new jobs for them. One of my go-to questions when I do interviews for to hire new people, I always ask them, tell me about the last technology or the latest technology that you learned and how you learned that. And if a person says, oh, I learned this in the software the client sent me in the course, or I learned this and this and this, there was a training session in the company, that's a negative for me. If a person says, oh, I actually learned a machine programming, R language, I learned um, advanced Excel functions. Um, I just went online and I Googled it myself. I went to Zoom's videos and I taught myself how to use Zoom. Um, I enrolled for a course in Udemy and I just learned that. That for me is the skill that I need in the future. Not that particular skill that you've learned, but that ability not to wait for the employer and the organization to send you somewhere to go and learn a skill, but your hunger and your desire to ensure that you learn things as you move forward. Second aspect um, is the societal and the, uh, the economic impact. And um, uh, again, around employment, but I'll give a, another angle on that shortly. Um, depending on where you go, um, the estimates on the amount of people that is being displaced globally um, is absolutely hair raising. And then the final one um, links back to what I've started to say is that, um, the half-life of skills um, has decreased according to Deloitte from 26 years to four and a half years. So, so, so I'm looking at Sabello and Sabella, if I remember you graduated, I think two years ago or three years ago already from the USB. So Bello paid us 250, 300,000 rand to do an MBA um, four or five years ago. What Deloitte says is all of the skills that he learned in his MBA in the USB, 50% of that will no longer be of any value in a year and a half or two years time. 
and we have to ask ourselves as educational institutions is what are we teaching are, are we teaching the skills that people need today or are we teaching the competencies and particular attributes that managers will need to succeed in the future because to teach a person a particular skill today does not make them employable for 20 or 30 years but to develop the ability to teach develop the ability to learn to um, trigger the curiosity to understand what is happening in the world around us that's what we actually need to do professor meshak as your porno is following me on this one meshak is a development economist I mean, Meshach studied development economy and we became one of the world's foremost authors in that particular space. Nobody heard the word fintech. Today, if you're an economist and you're working in developing economics and you do not understand how fintech and financial technologies are changing that particular industry, the industry will probably spit you out in five to 10 years time as a dinosaur of the past that don't understand the, uh, the tools of the trade that is being used to manage in that particular industry. And that then brings me to, to the key challenges so that we can understand the African value contribution. And there's a couple of key challenges. Um, the one challenge that I sometimes hear is that people resist um, change and people don't want to change and don't want to adopt these new technologies. They want to, don't want to do new um, ways to work. Um, that's not new. Um, it was around at the invention of the wheel, as you can see there. And people forget that when um, the printing press was invented and Gutenberg showed the printing press to the world, there was an absolute revolt. The people said, well, how dare you to put the written word in the hands of common people? Uh, the written word is for the clergy, the higher learned, learned people that sits within the Roman Catholic Church. They should be the custodians of knowledge because they actually know what to do with the knowledge. Um, you are creating a future in a society that none of us can control if we print books and musings of people and we just send that out into the wide world. Now, that was true for the printing press on the perspective of society. Um, I don't think we necessarily foresaw um, what social media and things are doing to us in the world today. But that's not new to the fourth industrial revolution. Um, there are many, many challenges. I want to pick three challenges because I think Africa can, can contribute to these three challenges. The first challenge is that we have to understand what is being automated this time around. If you look at the first and the second industrial revolution, it was physical work. People used to plow, people used to harvest, people used to turn things around, people used to take the corn and to turn the corn um, with a handheld device into flour that I can bake a bread. And the, this, the first and the second industrial revolution to a large extent was around physical work. It was first a steam engine and then it was um, oil and synthesis and internal combustion engine. The third industrial revolution actually replaced knowledge work, but structured knowledge work. So the ability, um, we could always add one plus one is two, but when we get to 7,263 multiplied by 429, now we have to take a little bit of time to actually make that calculation. And what the third industrial revolution did is it helped us to automate knowledge work but it was always very structured um, computers are actually very good at dealing with bounded reality there shouldn't be more degrees of freedom that we can do and it should always have um, comprehensive data sets so certain elements of human processing ability um, knowledge work um, was um, automated and um, sped up in the third industrial revolution the fourth industrial revolution is combining both of that because an autonomous vehicle is performing both the work of a horse that took us somewhere, but it's also performing the work of a taxi driver that knew how to drive in the traffic in New York. And now all of a sudden, it's both the knowledge and the physical work that we are being replaced. And that puts entirely new perspective on all of this is because we have to understand the impact on multiple dimensions. And I will uh, mention that briefly. The second one is um, the cyber physical systems are actually making decisions. And, and these decisions that they are making is really, really interesting because ultimately, and, and I apologize for the computer scientists in the room, but if I can simplify it, Ultimately, computers make decisions just in two different ways. The one way is that 
we think about all the conditions that they may confront in future. So we can program them to say a robot is green and yellow and red. And green means go, yellow means go quickly, and red means stop. And that's how we program it. If they get to a light with the robot where there's a blue light, or apologies, I'm South African, I talk about robots, I meant the traffic light. If they get to a traffic light where there is a blue or a brown light, or if the orange look yellowish, then you have a problem. The second way in which they make decisions is that we actually fit them with very large sets of information and the outcomes. And based on the very large sets of information and outcomes. So we don't tell them what red, yellow, and green mean. What we show them is 10,000 cars approaching traffic lights. And they learn from the behavior of the cars what the traffic light actually means. It means is we do not have to understand what it means. We don't program the logic in there is they learn by example. And that, by the way, is how human beings learn as well. You can tell a child 1,000 times not to touch a hot stove plate, but when they touch it and they burn their fingers well, they have learned from experience. Or if they see their friends doing that 100 times, they learn from experience as well. Now, those are the two ways that um, decisions are being made. And the challenge is whatever biases we may have in society, we then actually transfer into that decision making. So, so I may think that a yellow light means go very quickly before it turns red. Um, Yolanda, which is on the call, thinks a yellow light means slow and stop. Um, and, and now there are conflicting. And depending on whether Martin or Yolanda programs that particular algorithm, it will behave differently. I, I shudder to think how autonomous vehicles will behave if they monitor the road users in South Africa. We are completely lawless on our roads. And if they would study how people would behave on the roads in South Africa, there's a very dim future for all of us. So you would have to go to an environment where people are actually obeying the, the basic principles of the rules of the road. Um, and that would then be the way that they learn. The challenge here, ladies and gentlemen, and we have to make a contribution is that all of our embedded biases that we as human beings have is actually transferred into all of these decision-making algorithms. And there are lovely examples globally of how um, if sexism is embedded within the data set that you use, then you have an automated algorithm that is always 100% sexist. If um, the tone of your skin color um, is easier or more difficult to distinguish, um, and the cameras don't necessarily account for that, then it means there will be more false positives in terms of wrongly identifying people with all of these myriads of cameras that we have where, wherever we are. And this is becoming a serious problem as we think that we have more objective decision making, but the algorithm beneath the objectiveness was actually ultimately defined either by a human or trained by large sets, sets of data. And then the third one, is how we interact with, um, and, and I'm, I'm talking about a subset here of the fourth industrial revolution, just to make it slightly more practical, the robotics and artificial intelligence and, and, and what is the impact of all of this. And um, I, would, I would like to, to give you a practical example of the third one before I wrap up with the three things that I believe that Africa can actually contribute. And um, I would like to transport you back um, 120 years um, uh, Maritza, I see your question and Yolanda as well. I will deal with your, your, your questions now. So if you, if you go back uh, 120 years um, and, and you say it is the year 1900 and a group of scientists are, are gathered, just imagine they said the following. The Industrial Revolution is certainly going to make us more productive. So people are very happy. And in the long run, raise the standards of living. Once again, congratulations, they were correct. But we appear to be pumping a lot of carbon into the atmosphere, which will likely come back to haunt us in a couple of centuries. So we should think about how to prevent this problem. The reality is that conversation did not take place. No group of scientists and inventors and business people actually met and have a conversation about the long-term impact of the carbon that we are pumping into the air. And today, we have anything from health diseases to nations that's being flooded um, to climate change and multiple implications because of all of the carbon monoxide that we're pumping into the air. And the reason it didn't happen is 
we didn't have tools to measure the carbon. Um, we didn't have computer simulations to predict many of the things that we predict today. We didn't have a history of batting with other pollutants and governments and academics were simply not monitoring changes in the ecosystem. And I think that is a very important concept to take into mind because there is a huge negative implication. Yes, there's a positive um, implication in terms of internal combustion and what we've done, but the negative implication, we only understand 100 years down the line. And the challenge we have to ask ourselves as we are blurring these physical um, and digital boundaries and especially interaction with human beings as well as, do we understand the future? I, I always have to use this example, tongue in the cheek. I no longer have teenagers at home, both of my kids, my youngest is now 21. But then when they were teenagers, I always said that the, the, the emotional intelligence of some of our teenagers today is going to be a problem because they've never had um, that awkward situation of breaking up with the other human being and saying, it's not you, it's me, and we can still be friends and everything. They just send a WhatsApp message to break the relationship, which means there's a particular set of social skills that they've never developed. I'm wrapping up. What can we contribute from the continent? I think we have to be part of the long-term impact discourse. Um, we have amazing people on this continent. We have thought leaders and we have to force ourselves into the impact discourse. And if the impact discourse is not strong enough, we have to stimulate that impact discourse and say, is this, what is the long-term implications of everything that is happening now? Because it's something that we can contribute to. We don't have to design all of these things to contribute to that particular discourse. The second thing that I think is really important is we also have to be part of the moral imperative. We, we have to be part of the conversation on the continent to say, is this, how are decisions being made? How can we influence these decisions that are being made? And McKinsey here um, summarizes it very well. He says, AI has the potential to help humans make fairer decisions, but only if we carefully work towards fairness in all AI systems as well. And we have a really interesting context on the continent. We are not necessarily going to develop these systems, but we're going to apply these systems. And we have to take and test some of the latest and the newest systems and understand if it does make fair decisions within our own particular context. And if it does not, we have to push back and we have to ask fundamental questions about the algorithms, the moralities, and all of these underlying things that will be automated in the future and we will, we will not have a visibility in terms of how that particular decision was being made. And then finally, um, this is my particular view. I did really interesting research with a student of mine now. Um, the title of his research was The Robot Ate My Job. And the, re the, the net result of our research is that technology does not destroy employment, period. But it changes the structure of the economy. And Gartner says AI will automate 1.8 million people out of work, but will create 2.3 million new jobs. And for educational institutions and an educational industry, we have to ask ourselves is, are we preparing those 2.3 million people for the work of the future, or are we still training the 1.8 million for work that will no longer be there? We have to be part of the global agenda that sets the skills. South Africa has massive unemployment, but if you go online, you will see there are hundreds, if not thousands of employment opportunities, and many of these positions are not being filled because we are not creating the right skills. And this will only become bigger in the future as um, the fourth industrial revolution is fundamentally changing the structure of the economy. I believe that um, we will not develop cutting edge technology in Africa. Um, we will find interesting applications. Um, we can be the test bed um, to figure out many of these complex challenges on the application side of it. We can contribute to the decision and the moral algorithms and we should be part of defining um, the skill sets for the future. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Um, I see I've run out of time. I don't want to have Meshach start late. Um, I'm going to very quickly selectively dive into one of two of the questions. Um, Geraldine, unless you want to step in and um, direct the questions or the conversation. Thank you so much, Prof. Um, I believe we, we've gotten a few nuggets that would help us shape our ideas and decisions in, in terms of the fourth industrial revolution. 
There are a few pointers that I'm picking. And one is that we have to force ourselves to the impact of this course, whether we like it or not, Africa is, should be in. Um, we should be part of the conversation. And I'm saying that we would have to bring our, our seats to the table because Africa is relevant in, in terms of the fourth industrial revolution. And then execute the agenda and create skills. Sorry, my video was off. And create skills that are in demand. So the focus should be on the 2.3 million that we need to train so they build the skills for the fourth um, industrial revolution. There are a few questions that I want to go through quickly um, before we move to the next session. The first question is coming from Fibien. I'm, I'm sure I'm pronouncing the name right. And he, he's asking, um, Prof. Martin, International Labor Organization projection. Um, over one, 11 million young folks will join Africa working population each year over the next decade. How can Africa leverage the fourth industrial revolution to maximize this demographic advantage? Thank, thank you, Geraldine. I, I can actually see the question, so I'll very quickly dive into to three of them. So, Fibian, thank you for that. Um, I think there are already examples. I think a country like Rwanda is doing brilliantly with the education system. So the short answer is it's going to be a challenge, but we have to lead in terms of how we redesign education. We have to ask ourselves, does everybody have to go to university to get an M master's or get a PhD, all of these things? We have to understand what skills will be required in the future. And um, we cannot wait for the rest of the world to set the agenda, Fibian. We, we actually have to, to, to set the agenda. So Rodina, I'm quickly going to, to jump to two others. Maritza, I think it's probably Maritza Curry, also one of our alumni. Um, refer yes. to talent retention. Um, can Africa approach contribute to the 4 IF a unique value proposition and ICT specialist? Maritza, I, I, I really love your question and knowing the industry that you're working within as well. I absolutely believe that. I, I think our context is so rich and so different. You, in, 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 in an African country, in an Africa, you're dealing with so many complex things um, on a daily basis that we actually have the ability to be a test bed to try things out very quickly in our environment um, that the rest of the world can actually learn from. So because of our different context, Maritza, I, I, I firmly believe that, that we can. And I see Prof. Rian Ratman is in the room as well. He says the fact that I have are strongly rooted um, a social change gives a hope that this revolution will not result in the same pitfall experience in previous revolutions. Rian, I, I agree with you 100%, and it's kind of where I wanted to allude to in the end. Um, but the imperative is ours, Geraldine, and that's where I want to wrap up is we, we on, on the third, on the second and the third industrial revolution, we became consumers of the products. We either manufactured it under license or we bought the products that came into our harbor. This time around, we have to ask that question that Fibian and Marisco is asking and a comment that Rian is making and saying is, how do we shape the agenda? How do we contribute? How do we address the problems that there is at the moment that nobody has yet addressed? So that people will look at us and say, that's an interesting perspective. How do we make that part of the agenda moving forward? Thank you so much. Thank you, Prof. Um, there are two other questions I want you to maybe respond to before we wrap up. Christelle is asking, what are the key skills, requirements of leaders in the fourth industrial um, revolution and beyond in reshaping their environment with their teams? So allow me to, to punt um, the USB's website. Um, on our website, we have the USB management review. And I actually wrote an article which was published two weeks ago um, that is a comprehensive answer to that one. And in there, I refer to um, certain skill sets, the evergreen skills that will always be in demand, the digital specific skills that will be in demand, and then what I think is the skills for the future. And surprisingly, a lot of that centers around emotional intelligence and dealing with human beings in this new world that we're dealing in. But um, Christelle, I, I hope and everybody interested in, in, in my view about the skills of the future, you're more than welcome to read, to read that article. Geraldine, I think you said you had two questions. Is there another one you want me to take quickly?
Colleagues, I think that's it then from me. Um, to, I don't want to steal Meshach's time. So thank you so much. Um, you're more than welcome to engage. And thank you, Owen. Um, Owen actually tweeted the link um, to that um, article that um, you're more than welcome to read. Thank you so much. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to share it with you today. Um, and that's it from my side. Thank you so much, Martin. My internet was off, so I might have missed <laughs> the last two or three minutes. Um, you didn't miss a lot, Christelle. There was just agreement in the room that um, you should pay me uh, two, ca two cases of pitotage for, for the presentation. So, so you, you missed that, but other than that, nothing important. I'm sure my internet provider knew this was going to happen. So we got <laughs> Thank you for that. Uh, maybe Geraldine wants to say something. It was an awesome presentation. <clears throat> um, it was. I, I, I think we have learned a lot. Um, and where we fall in the uh, space of the fourth industrial revolution, it starts with us as individuals, I believe. Um, and then the businesses and organizations that we re represent and how we can impact our space and environment to be relevant in, in this um, time and age, and especially with COVID bringing it to the fore. So thank you very much, everyone, for being here. I'm sure you have a lot to take home and also to share with um, colleagues and friends so that together we can have a seat, as Prof said, at the table when it comes to um, the fourth industrial revolution. Thank you so much. Thank you, Geraldine. Thank you so much, Martin, for this very insightful presentation. Martin can read all the comments in the chat box. Awesome presentation. Great. Thank you. Love your pinotage. We know that. <laughs> Thank you very much. And I do not want to waste anybody's time. I want us to go straight over then to the next session which will be present, uh, facilitated by Dr. Mariki van der Merwe and presented by Professor Mishak Aziakono. Martin also um, referred to Mishak's role in the development finance development and a great leader in that field. And I, with that, I would like to do a very quick introduction of, um, let me just get my screen, of Dr. Mariki. I'm not